the title of this shia is called uh, A Good Friend, and I'd like to uh, base the, uh, the theme of the shia from Sukkim in Koheles in Perek Dalad. Shlomo Amelech says, V'shavti ani v'er er, hevel tachas ha-shomesh. I looked and I saw, and I realized that there is a vanity, a, a, a waste of time, uh, which I saw in the world under the sun. Yesh echod ve'ein sheni. Perek Dalad is posit zayin. There's one person and he's a loner. Not, we're not talking about somebody who's unmarried, who can't find a shidduch, but a person who purposefully chooses to do everything by himself and doesn't have a connection with anybody. You'll see in a second what we mean. The ain sheni, gamben the ach ein lo. He might have a brother, but he disowns him. He's a loner, independent person on principle. The ain kates the chala moloi, and there's no end to his efforts that he makes. Gam einov lo yispa oisha. All the riches that he makes, he tries to make more and more. He's never satisfied. And who am I working for? Says Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon, that this is just a vanity in the world, that people look after themselves, are totally independent, individualistic, and they don't really relate to anybody else. Says Shlomo HaMelech, but two, in reality, are far better than one. They have a great reward from all the efforts which they make. It's interesting, Rashi makes a point on this posseg. When he says two are better than one, it doesn't mean that one and one makes two. It means one and one makes ten or a hundred. Meaning, once you have people working together in partnership, and trying together, the initiative and the, the inspiration that they have of two together is far greater than one and one. It's, that's what it means, socha toy bamola, much greater when they come together and they combine their efforts and they combine their, their siyata dushmaya, that the help that they get from Hashem when they're working together. Ki im yiplu ho'echad yokim If one falls, the other will help the other one up. If one person falls and there's no one there to help him, then what's going to be? He's got no one to help him at all. He's by himself and he'll collapse. The way Hashem wanted to create the continuation of the human race is two people together and not one. And that's the, the partnership, the two together, of course, and Hashem is between them. But the idea is that it's two and not one who further the world, who continually uh, habit the world. And if a person comes and attacks an individual and they're two, two are much greater than one person. But if you have three, that's even stronger. It doesn't quickly snap. A three ply string is much stronger than two, the strength. The Bali Musa explained that often refers to also to uh, a marriage. Jack and Jill, when they're together, they're just a twosome. But Avram and Sora, a Jewish marriage is made of three, Hachut HaMashulash. The idea is that Hashem is between them, that makes a much stronger connection. And not quickly do they snap, the marriage will stay together. But we'll come on to that a little later. What we see from these verses in Koheles is the concept of togetherness, of friendship, the value of friendship. And there are other chazal which are brought out. For example, kenelo chochover, acquire for yourself a friend. And we know you have to give up in order to gain a friend. Hizharu bekovod chaveirecho, be careful of the covered of your friend. These are all Chazal, statements of the sages, which are very well known. But I'd like to make a suggestion. When it comes to this concept, the idea of friendship, we flounder on the abstract. We have beautiful phrases like we are to a better than one, as we've seen here. But we don't actually come out, I think, with a code of practice. I mean like this. 
If a person wants to have a kosher kitchen, so he looks into Shulchan Aruch and he realizes there are rules and regulations, there's a practice to it, there's a, a formula. If a person wants to pray, he looks in Shulchan Aruch. If you want to see how to, to run a business and there are laws of, of ribis and interest and all different aspects of paying workers, there's a Shulchan Aruch. But we don't have, if we can suggest such a thing like a Shulchan Aruch, a code of practice of friendship of how people are supposed to work together. And what I'd like to do in this shia is to bring a case study from David and Yehoinasan, King David and his friend Jonathan, using very much the references which we see in the Novi, in Shmuel, and to try and build up some sort of plan and formula by which a friendship works and the way it's supposed to work. I'd like to begin with a Mishnah in Pekei Ovas, in Perek Hey, Mishnah Tez Zayin. And it's a Tana, remember, this is one of the great teachers in Klal Yisrael, in the Mishnah, it's is written by Tanoim. So these are statements of great, great Rabbonim. Kol av, shehi tuluya badova, if you have a love between two people, but it's dependent on something, Rashi says, anything like in particular, they love money, they love travel, they love music, they love sport, uh, they love eating in restaurants together, they love movies. It's dependent on something. There isn't really a bond between them, but they make their relationship like a friendship of, it's a connection, it's a love, which they have, but it's based on something in particular. Once the the, the theme which binds them disappears. There's no money. There's no movies anymore. There's nowhere to travel. So, Botlo Ha'av. She'ena Tuliya says the Mishnah. But it's not dependent on something specific. But, says Rashi, it's dependent on a friendship, an intimacy. We'll see in a little later that the Rambam takes it much further and says that it's dependent on something spiritual, a devar eloki, when there's a much more a spiritual bond which keeps them together, then it's everlasting, it's eternal. Says the Mishnah, what is a, a love which was dependent on something specific? Where we see that it was a purely a physical lust and attraction and uh, Afterwards, there was no connection, there was no Abba left. It was based on a physical desire, and then once it was over, it was the love had finished. There wasn't anything to start with. And this is the point I'd like to bring out. Zu Abbas, David, and Yohannesson. And this was a connection where we can actually take a, a code of practice here, and we can see from this Tana, and what I'd like to do and see in the Novi as well, that there were certain points in the way David and Yonason related together which will give us some sort of a guideline of how friendship actually works. I should mention, actually, by the way, very interesting, the Maharal in Derech Hashem explains on this Mishnah that most of us are not like Amnon and Toma, nor like David and Yonason. We're somewhere in between with most of our relationships. That's probably very, a very comforting thought. To say that every friendship and relationship is like Dovin and Yonis, it's unlikely. It is Tulia Badovo. And the Maharal explains what you have to do in order to make it a lasting and genuine friendship is move more towards the Eina Tulia Badovo. Move, move more. In other words, you can have a relationship which is 60 40, but if it's 60 which is dependent on something spiritual and a real intimacy in a friendship, then it will last much longer than if it's the other way. If it's 60 more of Tuliya Badova and only 40 of friendship, then in other words, we have to move more towards the perfect role model rather than uh, ex expect that we're going to be able to live in extremes. And that's a very important point. It's a comforting point when it comes to friendship because most of us are not... Uh, don't have that thought of Amnon and Toma and David and Yonason, but the idea is that 
we should try and manipulate and maneuver our friendship so that it becomes more in our mind, in our connection, more enatuli of meaning dependent on something which is spiritual, which we'll see in a minute in the Rambam, rather than something which is tuli of But what I'd like to do is to give six points, which I worked through the Novi, through the Novi Shmuel, and I think they come out with some sort of code of practice which might be very useful in, uh, in a relationship, in the, the gift of a good friend. The first is this point of Enatulia Badova, not dependent on something. When Yonason was killed in battle on the Gilboa, David, David Amelech, said a Hesford, a funeral oration. And this is what he said, it's the most beautiful posuk in Shmuel Beis, Perak Aleph, Posuk Kovvov. Tzali Olecha Ochi Yehoinasen. I'm very distressed over you, my brother Yehoinasen. I miss you a great deal. Noam Toli Ma'oid, you are extremely pleasant to me. Nifleso Ahavoscho Li Me'avas Hanoshim. Your love for me was a wonder, more than the love of women. The Nitzir from Velozhin explains, what did David mean here? Meaning, it should have really have said, Niflaso ahavoseinu, our love was a wonder. What did he mean when he said, your love for me, talking about Jonasan who had been killed, and David was, was mourning him? Says the Nitziv, the way David saw the relationship, it wasn't in reality how Jonasan did, but how David saw it was like this. Jonasan was the prince, the son of the king, Shaul, Shaul, next in line to the throne. He was a very distinguished, important person in Eretz Israel. David was the king's fugitive. He was a man on the run. Shaul employed over 3,000 soldiers in order to capture David. So David saw the relationship with Yonason as a one-sided relationship, meaning that I gave you, said David to Yonason, a bag of worms, a bunch of thorns, and you gave me great love. That is the wonder. In his understanding, that what did I do for you? <laughs> I didn't help you in any way. I was just a nuisance. Your father even wanted to kill. We'll learn later on that Shaul at one occasion at the banquet of Rosh Chodesh where David never turned out and David was supposed to play music there that Shaul even tried to kill him. He threw a dagger at him. He was very angry with him. So I gave you a problem. I gave you discomfort with your father and you gave me everything. You were the important, the next in line on the throne. So we see here, what does he mean also by me'avas anoshim? And then it explains the normal relationship, any woman who loves her husband dearly, it will only work on one basis, and that is if she feels her love is reciprocated, that it comes back from her husband. But if she's just giving and giving and not getting anything back, so he said he was even more than the avas anoshim, because I gave you nothing, said David in his, in his frame of mind. I gave you problems, I gave you tzoros, and you gave me everything, love. And that was a wonder to me. That was the nifla. So perhaps when we say that an ava which is ena tulia badova, it was even more than that. It wasn't that it wasn't ena tulia badova. It was based, said David, the way he saw it, that I gave you difficulties and solace and you gave me love. And I couldn't believe that. That was the wonder which I couldn't understand. So we see that the first point in a relationship, this is maybe the extreme, the way David saw it, but the basis of a relationship must be enatulia badova, not dependent on something, meaning like money or sport or looks or diamonds or travel or movies, whatever. That's weak because once the object of of interest is disappears, so the love disappears. I was thinking maybe, you know, they have always in the newspapers pictures of uh, President Obama shaking hands or hugging Netanyahu or the British Prime Minister or the French Prime Minister. <laughs> Don't be mistaken, <laughs> there's no love there. 
you see great friendship? Nah, it's Tuli Abadova. It's dependent that Obama is thinking, I'll get what I want, and Netanyahu will get what they want. It's not an Av or Sheina Tuli Abadova. Of course not. Of course not. It's dependent on something that they want, they want to get. So that friendship is it's not a genuine friendship. It's not a, a, a deep love. Of course not. No one would imagine that, but I just brought that as an extreme case. That a real friendship, though, must be based on genuine, a bond of friendship. And you'll see in a minute a, a spiritual connection, something much more than just an objective, tangible object which they enjoy together. That's the first point. The second, which I'd like to bring out, is that you see continually in Shmuel Aleph that the relationship between David and Yonason was no guessing game. It wasn't as if they assumed a friendship together. It was much, much more than that. David clearly expressed his affection to him, and Yonason replied. Let me read out a passage to you, and you'll get the point. But they, there was a bond which they expressed, which they felt, and it was a clear understanding between the two of them. In Shmuel Aleph, in Pewak Kof. Just listen to these words. He cried on his shoulder. What have I done? said David to Yonason. What is my crime? What is my sin? in front of your father's soul. What have I done? What? Why is he pursuing me? Why do I have to be a fugitive? What's my crime? Immediately, and Jonas and Thomas says, No, Khalilo, <laughs> no, no way, don't worry, don't worry. Lo, Thomas, you will not die at my father's hand. Why? How could Jonas confirm that? He ne loyosi dova, godol odova kot. My father doesn't do a big thing or a small thing. In his court, with his ministers, whatever is decided, whether it's in confidence or in secret, I know everything. I hear, I know. What happened? So, and I'm your best friend. So I'm there to protect you. Tell me, what do you want, David? And I'll do it for you. Clear. No doubts. No hesitation. A clear line of communication, of love, of caring. It's a very important concept when it comes to a friendship. It can't be a guessing game. It can't be something that is assumed and maybe it, it's, you don't see it here. And that's only one example which I've taken here. It was a very, very clear relationship between the two of them. That's it's not as if David went out to find a greeting card to send to, to Jonasson how much he likes him. Much deeper than that. It was something which was expressed, which was said out, which was clear, and was no, no doubt in anybody's mind between the two of them, David and Jonasson, how they felt for each other. That's, I'm suggesting, a second rule of conduct when it comes to friendship when it comes to a relationship. You see it here continually, all the way through. Uh, just come to the end of that paywork, it's about the arrows, which will come onto a little bit later, when Jonasson told Dobby that he'll shoot arrows beyond the rock, which will come to a little bit later. At the end of the chapter, Go and be well. Go and be well. We are bonded together in friendship. It was clear, it was said out, and there was no doubt of the relationship. That's the point I'd like to bring out here. Maybe we can add a, a beautiful story of the Rosh Yeshiva of the Mir Yeshiva, Agon HaTzadik, Reb Chaim Shmolevitz, Zeich HaTzadik Livrocha. In his early days when he was a Rosh Yeshiva there, and he had Talmidim, the Yeshiva was much smaller than it is now. Uh, but when one of his Talmidim got married, 
Reb Chaim would, after three or four months after they got married, uh, turn around to the Talmud and say, no, I'd like to come around to your house on Friday night. It was expected. This is what was known that would be, he would ask it to come around. And uh, he would turn up on Friday night and sit at the table and the Chosun was on one side and the Kala on the other side and Reb Chaim would sit in the middle. It, it was a procedure. And he would turn around to the Chosun and he would say, maybe, uh, maybe you've prepared a Dvar Torah to say. <laughs> He'd been working it for the last six weeks. <laughs> he knew this was going to happen. So he prepared a Dvar Torah to say for the Rosh Hashiva. This is what he was going to ask. And as soon as he'd finished, it was automatic. The Rosh Hashiva would turn around to the Kala, who was sitting in here, and he would turn around to her and say to her, what did you do in your life? What schusim merits do you have that you are married to such an exceptional Talmud Chofum here? <laughs> Your husband is such a, a scholar and such a fine person, of course. She would be quelling with pride over her, over her new husband. And then he would turn around and say to the, the young wife, maybe you've uh, some mazaynas, maybe we can have something to eat. And of course she'd prepare it, a chocolate cake and whatever and she would bring out and serve the Rosh Hashiva with coffee, whatever. And he would take something to eat and autumn he would then turn around to the, to the young married man and turn around to him and said, and what did you do to have such a fantastic bala, balabosta, a wife like this, who makes things so beautiful in your house? <laughs> Imagine what happened when Rosh Hashiva left the house. Yachad <laughs> kol from such a, no doubts full clarity. The love was expressed and he told them, he brought them together, but the, the lack of guesses, the lack, he made it clear that was his intention. Of course, of course he, he wasn't flattery. He wouldn't say things which were untrue, uh, but this was a, 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 a scheme here. He had to say something which was very, very positive about each of them to bring them together, but there were no guesses. There was, it was to make it clear what the relationship was. I'm suggesting that's what we learned from David and Jonas. They knew where they stood. The line of communication was completely open. Number three, a point, a third point, which is apparent in all of Shmuel, which is a rule of friendship. And that is called Noise Ba'oil Im Chaveiroi, to be there for the friend. In England they used to call this a fair weather friend. Like a person turns up when the food is good, when the lights are on, when there's music playing, and they disappear when things are hard. Or there's, That's not a friend. A friend is somebody who's there for all times. And you see that, as we mentioned previously, David was on the run. And if you look carefully in Shmuel Aleph, Shaul and 3,000 soldiers hunted him. And every time, Yonason found him, bought him food, helped him out miraculously. He was there for him, even at the expense of his own uh, monarchy of becoming the king afterwards. He gave everything up. He was there to help his friend David. And that's a very important trait in friendship. Of course, we see that trait coming out as well by Moshe Rabbeinu in Mitzrayim. In the beginning of Shemois, we learn, He went out to his brothers, Says Rashi, Nosan Einov Velibo Liyos Meitza Al Echov. He went out and he put his eye and his heart to care for his brothers, for Klal Yisrael. He cared. He cared. He, he carried them. The Medrash brings out that he would walk the streets of Mitzrayim crying, upset about what he saw an old man carrying a bundle which a young man should carry and a woman, and he switched the, the pekelach, the burdens, and he wept hard. He cared. He was nicer but oilim chaveirai. We see this continually. What exactly happened in Perak Kof, in the Perak 20 in, in Shmuel Aleph, we learn that, as we mentioned, David was supposed to have arrived at a, a banquet on Moshredish to play music, and he was scared. Yonason went in, and he then devised a scheme, which, just briefly paraphrasing what happened, that he would then come out into the field and having discovered what the mood of his father was, whether Shaul wanted to kill him or not, he would then, he said, I'm going to shoot three arrows 
and there'll be a ladder at the side, and I'm going to call out to the boy, the arrows are in front of the rock. If I say that, the plan was, it meant that David could come back into Yonis and he was safe. And if I would call out to the boy, the arrows are beyond the rock, it means you must run away. As we know, that's what happened. He ran to know the city of the Kohanim, and that was the beginning of his very difficult period of by the Dead Sea, the caves, and he hid from Shaul. But he was there for him. He looked after him. He found him and brought him food. This concept in friendship is, is a primary feature in friendship, to be there for somebody. Not just turn up at their wedding or uh, when there's a celebration going on, but you're there for all time. It's a very important principle that we learn from David and Yonason. It's interesting, the Sefer Hasidim brings down that the reason why the Jewish nation are not allowed to eat the, uh, the thigh of an animal, the Gid Hanosha, is because the sons of Yaakov of Vinu were not there when he was carrying the, the packages over the river when he was running away. If you remember the scene, and he, they weren't there for him. And because of that, al Cain lo yocha b'nei Yisrael es Gid Hanosha. It's a punishment because of not being there to help Yaakov of Vinu. Rabbi Yeruchim, explains what is the reason why when someone dies we make a hesped, a funeral oration. And maybe Uchem explains the reason is that the relatives are noise ba'ol, they carry the burden of the person who died, who is in Tsar, who has just died. And we relate the same way, we wail and we cry, that's the reason why we make a hesped. If you remember the Jewish nation were forced to wait seven days for Miriam in the wilderness, in the Midbar, when she had leprosy, all because she waited for Moshe Rabbeinu. She cared. She carried Moshe Rabbeinu, and therefore all of the Jewish nation waited and supported Miriam in her problems. This is a very important concept of the caring. The caring, the Neiseba oil, is a very important feature in friendship, which we learn, I'm suggesting, from the relationship between David and Yonason, but of course it goes into many other aspects of, of a friendship, of a relationship between people. It's a primary feature in, in the formula of, of a friendship. Maybe I can share a story with you, which uh, I remember illustrated this so much, how far it goes, this point of, uh, of caring for somebody. My wife actually pointed this story out to me. She read it in a newspaper several years ago that uh, one of a, a Rebbe in a yeshiva in Yerushalayim received an invitation to a wedding in America with a ticket enclosed. And he looked at the invitation, he looked at the ticket, and he was absolutely baffled because he didn't know who it was. This person, whoever it was, sent him a ticket with a wedding invitation and he didn't know who the chosan or the kala was. He didn't recognize anybody. He, he couldn't believe it. He went into the office and he saw that the boy actually learned in the yeshiva. And he looked at the lists of different bochim and different shirim and he discovered that he did not even teach this boy. And he was absolutely baffled as why he should receive an invitation with a ticket inside. And he was at such a loss, he called up the chassan, and he said, Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov to him. He didn't want to ask him, point blank, but uh, he just, we reconnected. He, he didn't remember him at all. And fortunately, the chassan preempted him and said, uh, you're probably wondering why I sent you a ticket. Well, yeah, I really am. <laughs> I really don't understand. Why did you send me a ticket? He said, no, I wasn't in your shia. He said, I know you weren't in my shia. And, and, so what's the connection? So he said, I'll tell you why I sent you a ticket. You won't remember me, of course not. But I came to the yeshiva several years ago, and I didn't know anybody. I didn't understand the shia. I had no friends, and I felt a complete and utter failure. A failure. And it got worse week by week. I came in September. By the time it came to October, November, I was finished. I said, I'm not staying anymore. I said, I'll give myself another week. It came to the other week and it, it just got worse. I packed my bags and went out to the front door. Listen to what happened. He said, I got to the front door 
And as I opened the door with my bags, I, was, I didn't even tell anybody I was leaving. I was just going straight to the airport and going home. It's not for me. As I was at the door, someone called out to me and said to me, one minute, your, your collar is up. Your collar is sticking up. Hang on one second, one second. And someone came over to me and straightened out my collar and gave me a real, like, pat on the shoulder. I said, you can't go out like that. The collar is up. So he put the collar, and he walked away. And it was you. I said, I really don't remember. He said, no, we probably don't. I stood there at the door with my bags. You went away. And I thought to myself, you know, you know maybe they really do care here. Very nice of that, that red guy. I don't even know who he is. I'll try again. He went back, he said, I unpacked my bags, and I went back into Shia, and believe it or not, I began to understand the Shia. I stayed in Yeshiva, then I came on to Lakewood, and I'm now getting married, and I'm a Yeshiva Boch, I've been in Lakewood for several years, and it's all due to you. I said, no. I said, really? <laughs> By your straightening out my collar, and giving me the pat on the back, that changed my direction in life. Remarkable story. That's called, and even that's not even called sharing the burden with somebody, but just the, the understanding, the caring of somebody else literally changed that young man's whole outlook towards learning Torah and put him on an entirely different path. Obviously, culture came when in a situation when someone really is there for somebody else, how important it is. And that I'm suggesting is a point, the third point. The first is the nice not to Luya Badovo. The second is the communication. The third is the, the carrying for somebody else. Fourth point, which I'd like to suggest as a code of practice of friendship. There is a certain feeling people sometimes have if you're close in friendship, that if you give up, you're weak. And if you stand by what you want to do, you're strong. And we see, therefore, if we take that into the relationship of David and Yonason, we might come out and suggest that Yonason was very weak because he kept on giving up. He gave up the throne, he gave up his future, he, he gave up everything for David. So he would be weak. Really? Listen to these words again in the Hesper, in the oration that David said about Yonason and Shoal when they died. And this isn't just poetry. This is standing by the graveside of his dear friend, Yonason. This is how he described him. Hatzvi Yisroel al cholo. The deer has been desecrated. Eich noflu hagiboyrim. How are the mighty fallen? Later on, Eich noflu hagiboyrim. How are the mighty fallen besoicha milchomo inside the war? Yonasan abba moisecho cholo. Yonasan on his heights was cut down. Ech noflu hagi boirim. How are the mighty fallen? The yovdu clay milchoma and all the tools of war are lost. Actually, these point which I'd like to bring out was said by the Queen Kerov at the funeral of the Chofetz Chaim. When the Chofetz Chaim died, said the Krim Karov that we are in a situation of